I'm Jennifer White and Karen Lee, thank you so much for bringing me. Karen knows how to throw a party, that's for sure. She's the hostess with the mostest, just like you all here in Hawaii. I'm very glad to be here. I came here years ago in one of those initial grants through the Department of Labor. There you go, I'm recognizing faces everywhere. I'm walking in the hallway going, wait, I know you, I know you. So the EFSLMP, one of those first grants through the Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy, I actually got to come and do a little bit of work with you in Hawaii. And it's really nice to see you again. It's really nice to be back here on this sacred land with you beautiful people. All right, so I'm gonna talk about success stories specifically for people who we've deemed unemployable. That's kind of been my story. Um, and it has helped us create a bunch of tools that actually work for everyone, not just, right, when we're building universal design, all of a sudden it makes it easier for and more accessible for humanity. So a lot of the tools that we're going to be covering today and talking about are based in that. Universal design is, the, is uh, the base of how all of us are born. So I'm just gonna give you a little intro first. Wait, let me back up. I'm Jennifer White. <laughs> we had technical issues, so now I'm like in the hurry up. Oh no, it's all good. Uh, I own a company called Able Opportunities. I started in the field supporting people with developmental disabilities when I was 13, because my dad worked in developmental centers and he would drop me off and say, Here's a kid with Down syndrome, have fun. Here's a really good teacher, learn from her. That's how I spent every summer from 13 on. And my first paid job was with the, in residential services. So I've been doing it my entire life. I've been in what we call right livelihood, getting paid to do what I love. In fact, it wasn't until I started supporting people to find their own jobs that I realized not everybody has right livelihood. <laughs> so, uh, so fortunately for me, that education brought me immediately to kids who were struggling with communication. And communication is power. So if you don't have the same communication as everyone else, you have behavior plans that address your behavior and reaction to the lack of power, but don't necessarily address the inequity. So that started me on a path of paying attention to inventing things that didn't exist yet. And we're gonna talk about some of those tools because then it moved into high tech and we, we've got to throw a bunch of stuff on there and we're still creating, of course. Okay, so I'm gonna talk to you about some of the people who've been diagnosed by six agencies to not leave their house, let alone get a job, who then worked stably for 16 years because we did something that we call uh, person-driven tools. Our field is very much based in my relationship with the person I'm serving. I get to know you, we understand each other, we figure it out, and then I leave and you're gonna work with Chloe. Now Chloe's good, but you have to start all over again when you work with Chloe. Because we don't carry information forward in a structural way, in a systemic way. So we're gonna target some of those tools today. Sound good? Yes. All right, I'm in. And thank you to uh, Riley and Patrick and Dylan who helped figure out at the very last minute how to resolve that I'm a Mac user and they had everything plugged into Microsoft. And what's your name with the blonde hair? Yeah. Leah. And Leah came up with the right app fix. Rock on sister. Teaching technology, right? You have to have a tech issue when you're teaching technology. All right, let's just start right here. How many people are social justice workers in this room? Okay. When you go to the dinner table and your aunt is visiting from another island and you haven't seen her since you, know, you were five years old and she says, so honey, what do you do for a living? How do you describe your job, what you do in this field? Here's my elevator speech to Aunt Sally. <laughs> my job is to level the playing field for people with disabilities to have the same rights and opportunities as you and I. Do you all agree that that's what we do for a living? Do you know what the the definition of social justice work is? Hey, guess what, you guys? You're all social justice workers. To level the playing field for marginalized groups of people to have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else is the definition of social justice. This was really helpful for me to learn because for years, 
uh, this gentleman in the back who's been bringing up the questions about the structural problems. I just want to applaud you for it because we are stuck there, stuck in the mud. And we're going to talk about some of the why and some, some structures that are working, just like Karen outlined, from the grassroots up to tell a different story and make something change there. Because understanding that we are social justice workers also brings a lot of wisdoms from other groups who've been focusing on social justice for a very long time. There's important information to understand about the structures that live where they do, and understanding that it comes from a point of view of marginalization can really help us. So for example, women, how long have we been working for the same dollar as the man in our position? That's right. <laughs> I'm 63. Since I heard language, I understood that we were in that fight, right? Why can't we change it? Because we don't come together. Because the system makes us, um, there's actually structures that stop us from coming together, right? There's, it's actually built into the system itself. So here's, a, 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 here's an example that makes it more concrete. When could a woman have her own bank account in her own name and start to, uh, start to build credit? Do you know? 1974. 1974, my mom was taking care of all the finances in the house. My dad's money skills are like this. What do you mean I'm overdrawn? I still have checks left, right? Like, he did not touch the money. He was given an allowance, like, in cash by my mother. She couldn't even check, you know, trust him with a check. And she couldn't have the bank account in her name. That's crazy. But most people are not aware that those structures are in place. What stops us from moving forward are, like Karen said, like, read the policies. There are real things stopping us from moving forward. And not organizing is actually built into the structure, right? OK, so how many social justice workers do we have in the room now? Mm -hmm, every single one of you, thank you. All right, now there's parts to this that can be very helpful to understand because we know what happens to marginalized groups of people. In fact, there are many marginalized people in this room, right? So what we know is that it, like, Karen, I'm just gonna keep referencing all the little analogies you used, you know, about turning the big, right, turning the Titanic or turning large ships, that it takes time to do that. But not understanding what you're turning towards or what's stopping you from turning in that direction is where I spent most of my career, right? I describe it as I took an ice pick to a glacier. One person at a time, and it's important to understand what works for people, but I've been working with one person at a time to develop these structures without understanding what was happening. So, number one, when we talk about marginalization, I just am so afraid of these. I'm just going to kick them away because I'm the tripping kind of girl. It's okay. It's all good. I don't know. Julia doesn't need one more job, does she? <laughs> Thank, you so right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <laughs> it's not quite tall enough for me, so I'm just going to duck. I'm gonna... In college, I took this mime class, and the, and the teacher asked, would somebody volunteer? Just show us the shower. And I went like this, you know, opened it up. And I didn't know why people were laughing, because <laughs> it was such a habit. All right, <clears throat> this is also a little funny, because here you go. I have, a per I have a privacy screen on my laptop. I'm gonna just gonna take it off, because we're doing so much. All right, there you go. Okay, so when we're, looking, when we're talking about marginalization, it means there's some things that we wanna walk in aware of. People with disabilities are a marginalized group of people, like people of color. Little Ruby Bridges went into the white school. How are we doing with race relationships in America? Right? So the ideas that we have about how to solve this don't actually get to the structural build that needs to happen for success. When I look at my job and where I've been and the, the services that I've offered and how I've talked to people and interacted with them, I bring so much of that with me. My own stories, my own aha stories are about, oh, I built it for my brain and yours doesn't work like mine, and I have the power to diagnose you. Uh-oh. So when we look at trying to make this shift, the first step is to build an ethos of curiosity. I have to understand that I swallowed ableism too. I'm in the field. I've been doing it a long time. I'm passionate about it. 
but I don't live with a disability like the person I'm serving, which means I'm not seeing the same thing they are. One of the greatest examples I have of this is when we look at all of the tools that we use to teach people language, every single one is based in English. Even the evaluation using visual information, here's a picture, is graded in English grammar. Uh-oh. So we want to start looking at some of the structural pieces, and we're going to talk about, connect that, those dots to these stories. We're building, right, we're building this time in this time where institutions are not completely closed down, but we certainly are closing them down. So here's the thing to look at. We've moved into person-centered. I'm going to find you. But the paperwork, task analysis, and database systems are exactly the same as they were when somebody lived in an institution. Uh-oh. So when you look at targeting information, like did somebody, what did they do today, your choices are they participated or they refused. I get to opt in or opt out, but the people that I serve refuse. It puts a different light on things. It's certainly not person-first language. So we want to start looking at some of those structural things, and because those, some of those structural things are out of our hands, at least collecting data that's going to tell a story about needing to change that. <clears throat> oh, wait, I wanted to go back and just say, this book, Beyond Inclusion, Beyond Empowerment by Leticia Nieto, I advise everybody to get it. It's a curriculum book, so get your company to buy it for you. <laughs> but it's this, the tagline in the book is Strategies to Free Us All. She addresses oppression and marginalization in ways that allow people to really come at a pace where they can start to turn like that ship. And then some of the fascinating things. I want to stay fascinated. There's a music teacher. He invented this little strategy for himself. He realized when he's stuck in his habits and he's talking to himself or he's listening to some other teacher and doubting or ex exalting what they have to say, he wants to break the habit of shame when he starts to kind of spiral down. He just throws his hands in the air and yells, fascinating. So I'm going to tell you about some of my fascinating moments that I feel bad about, but, I, the teach, but shame stops te learning. It stops growth completely. So I want to stay fascinated so I can keep paying attention to keep moving forward. Here's, I got involved in deafness and deaf blindness uh, uh, when I went back to school to get my master's because it was required to be a teacher. And I took a sign language class as an elective not be because I'd already taken puppet making, like literally had no connection to the deaf community. And it changed the course of my understanding, the course of my career, the course of everything. Because the program that I went to was full of deaf blind teachers. And deaf blindness was a place where I could see that the right accommodation changed the world. It changed who I was standing across from. Not at all, it didn't change them, it changed them being able to show up with me, me being able to meet them for who they are and see them for who they are. It also taught me a lot about universal design. Universal design is based in the universal brain. We are all human beings born with the, vir with the visual brain, all of us. Fully blind people, because matter is structured in what you see, same visual brain, same organization. Then we learn language and we start to structure it in different ways. Now, the fascinating part is there are only three languages in the world that didn't follow the natural development of the brain. English, bummer. Chinese, bummer. Largest two populations in the world. And Greek. Every other language. So we have these barriers to work against that we need to start to pay attention to. One of these other things that happens is our eye-hand coordination, right? I'm going to teach you something. What do I do? I teach you. Here you go. I teach you that this cover has a little flap on it on my phone. And so I'm going, to take my, I'm going to put my hand on top of yours and teach you how it works. It's our habit. In fact, when you go to school to study supports for blind individuals or you go to school to study how to become a psychologist, they teach that that is the most efficient and least intrusive way to teach someone. Julia, would you be my lovely volunteer? Round of applause for Julia. It was actually, we call this voluntold. <laughs> I 
All right, so I'm just going to show you. I'm going to touch you. Is that okay? Your yes. hands. Okay, so I'm going to take your hand and I'm going to show you how this, like, come, you know, get, let me get your other hand involved. Okay. We take it, we open it up, and then I open this other flap. Okay, now as opposed to, hey, Julie, I've got this phone. Put your hand on top of mine. I want to show you how this works. Feel that? Oh, Look at that. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Now, she is starting to feel the flap herself. That moment that she has her internal uh, intrinsic motivation for mastery, meaning I get it, I can do it, I can start to back out. If my hand is on top of her, I'm teaching her how to wait for me, which means I'm teaching Q, Q dependence. No human being is born with it. We teach all of it. Round of applause for Julia. <laughs> I'm sorry, Julia, I forgot to ask you. Do you feel the difference between those two things? Okay, so number one, if there's anything that you take from today from me, get yourself four inch, piece, uh, polar fle four inch pieces of polar fleece, because that goes in the washer and dryer, because your eyes have germs like your mouth does, so you can wash it in between uses, and start wearing a blindfold every once in a while. Get out your clothes, then put the blindfold on and try to get dressed. See what happens when you disrupt your main ways of organizing information. Your eyes and your ears are the, queen, the queens of the kingdom, right? So you would disrupt those because people with intellectual developmental disabilities, things come in, they go through the nervous system to the brain, the brain does what it does and it comes back out. That whole nervous system is affected in different ways at different levels for people with IDD. That means our habits with our eyes and ears need to be checked because we have to strengthen everything else we do, our tactile delivery, how succinct I am at giving information. All right, so here's one of those aha moments for me. Wow, did I not understand this about cue dependence. I started, t I started watching people cueing and I walked around with little, you know, my little notability app and I'm tagging and then I'll ask the person after it, this was an hour and 15 minutes supporting a young man who cleans an office who has significant support needs. I asked her how many times she thought she cued him during this time and she said, I know it's really high at least 10 times, seven to 10 times. And she had cued him 454 times. Now when I, when I first took this data, I didn't tell anybody because I thought I was crazy. I had to look at it for a year myself and get really solid information because we're counting everything. If you say something and touch something and point something and body block and physically, all of those things are cues or I'm doing it for you, that also counts. So tallying all of this up, we are on average 40% off in understanding how much we cue people. We have this nice sheet now, so on the bottom we can target teaching. So like saying good job at the very end of doing something is teaching, but saying good job every two seconds is cueing. So we train people how to do this. We take video while we're cueing. We don't tell them that's what we're doing because everybody tries too hard. But tally, somebody films, and then we look at it with them because it is so hard to believe this about ourselves, right? Us with the good hearts. We're in the, we're in the field where we wanna make a difference for people. We care about people, but our good hearts are not gonna change the system. So gathering and collecting actual data to do that, and we're gonna to get to numbers and making, uh, breaking the myth of math for employers as one of those ways to get to some st big tr structural changes. We started doing what we call person-driven tools because if I did work with you and we developed something, if we build something together that you can bring with you, when you start working with Chloe, there's not such a disaster of change. We know that routine is one of the most important things in people's lives, right? We work with folks with IDD, what causes most behaviors? Routine changed, somebody didn't cause, something changed. Now, we all have disruption in our lives and we all get, and get distressed about it. But if it is the only thing I am relying on because you all have done something different and I can't secure in that, then it becomes a disaster. Because if I touch my chin and you think I'm hungry and you think I'm signing mom and you think I'm self-stimming, then there's no settling into anything except the routine. 
So we started doing this thing that we call person driven. And what that means is when you, I'm just gonna keep picking on you because I started. Don't worry, the back of the room, I'm gonna pick on you next. What's your name? Brittany, lovely Brittany. So Brittany and I work together. Yeah, round of applause for Brittany. <laughs> Brittany and I work together. I understand how she rolls. I understand some of her expressions. We wanna capture that on film in what we call a self-advocacy film so that she can take it with her and show it to the next person. Or a customer film file if Brittany's not quite sure about film and how it works, so that when you start to work with Brittany, that four inch file, because we know she has a lot of behavior, right? Just look at her, you can tell she's a Riley one. That four inch file is gonna tell us how she's been treated, not actually who she is or what she needs or what she looks like when she's, you know? So we want her to be able to capture that. Now technology's really allowed us to do that. These person driven tools mean I'm gonna work with you. This is what you want. We're gonna build a structure that you can take with you when I'm not here. We do low and high tech stuff. In, you'll get a copy of this and on our website you can go in and look at you know, more people using different technology. We do low tech stuff like cameras and printers. How many people uh, that you support are in residential services also? Yeah. When you walk in their house, do you see pictures of the staff in the order that they're showing up in that, on that day? Do you have a visual reference of the staff schedule? There is one, two people nodding their heads. It's, it's right, really should be everywhere because not everyone in the home, right, who's gonna be in my house that day? And again, not for a lack of good hearts, but for a lack of management that we've had in our system. So cameras and printers can also mean, okay, uh, let's see, in the back corner, what was your name? You, you got the lay to Julie? Julie and I go and get coffee, but Julie doesn't, she's got a lot of anxiety or she's got speech that's hard to understand. And so who orders for Julie? I do. <laughs> so instead, we both want to get coffee, take pictures of it, label it, and carry them in our wallets. And then we, I model, model, model how to do things, and Julie comes forward as she's ready. So I have a picture of her order, too. If she's not ready, that's okay. I'm going to keep showing her how it works and let her come at her pace. I have to understand that most people that I meet, by the time they're adults, have been managed by hundreds of individuals, which means how much trust do they have that a new person is going to do something? So I have to be very smart about how I'm interacting with someone. I'm not going to make you do it. In fact, there are a lot of laws I'd like to change, without a doubt. But the one that I would start with is that all support goals are written for the staff. Because if we get consistent about how we offer and model it for you, you will come forward if it's going to get you something. Right? <clears throat> okay, so I'm getting, I'm the fire hose presenter, so I'm gonna kind of move through a lot of stuff because I wanna get you, get you to some films. Um, you can make books, you know, with your own kids at home to get good at how to use the tools. This is a deaf student in Alaska who'd gone to school for 17 days total the year before I met him. Of course, we got a deaf mentor up there to work with him and interpreters in school, and that's, that changed the game. But before we got to do that, we brought a, I brought a camera and printer and started working with him on just making stories about things that were happening. And he started coming to school, first only when, my plane, when a plane came in and he knew I was on it. But then his peers started making stories. He didn't know how to sign when I met him. I'm teaching him these signs right beforehand. Here's Barry. He's now teaching the, the other students and correcting them when they're wrong, even though he just learned the sign a second ago, right? So this shift to person-driven, he's now the photographer making the stories, bringing them home, making a separate one for school, the kids are reading it during story time, et cetera. I have people, I wanna make sure that all of us know how to use the tools. So it's gotta be enjoyable, right? Have you heard that statistic about the elementary school teacher who evaluated how, long, how many, um, how many cues or how many opportunities it takes to learn a new skill. It's like almost 400 times to really retain it. Unless you're having fun, then it's 12. I know. 
And I tell you, we really see this around person-driven tools. People allow, being allowed to touch. I mean, somebody who can have a camera on their hands who's been throwing things, and that's the reason I got called in, is looking at me like, really, are you kidding me? You're gonna let me have this? <clears throat> because pictures, visuals, right? A picture, how's it go, a thousand words? Picture tells a thousand words? Worth a thousand words, because in one instant, I can take in so much data as opposed to language, which is like the funnel, right? It's, I have to get to it in a linear fashion. So these visuals get to do something like read, we're telling stories across environments. Because that term natural supports, how did you learn about, how did you gain your own natural supports? Anybody? How did you, how do you get natural supports in the workplace? Ask questions, you talk to each other, you tell stories. I flew here from Washington, I used to live in Washington. Seriously, where? Right, we connect about where, what we've done and who we are. So this Stories Across Environment is a really strong tool to help people join the rest of the group without me needing to tell stories on behalf of Reed. Now we started late, so I'm gonna really whip through some stuff, okay? But I want you to feel free to call me anytime. This translates into him taking pictures with his boss about here's the jobs. This guy was deemed unemployable by six people. He's somebody who would stand in one spot all day until you told him what to do next. And then all of a sudden he's self-propelling through his day. The two most powerful things that impact work production and motivation are direct connection to the employer using whatever structure you can, visual ones, we're gonna show you an electronic one soon, and understanding money. Most people we serve don't touch their money. What's the difference between work and everything else? I get paid and I, have to, I get to make decisions about that pay. Without that, the difference between going bowling or going to the pool or going swimming is not, it, mean, it leaves us in a situation, and here's one of those marginalization pieces. I am cheerleading you to get you to understand why it's so important to be here on time or do this work or do it this way. When really, if you're connected to money, you can make your own decisions because your own consequences are going to come from that. We do uh, pictures. We start with cameras and printers cooking a lot of the time because you don't need to know what a half a cup is. You can just use the blue measuring cup. You can buy color-coded measuring cups. They actually have tactile cups now. There's a whole cup, a half a cup, a quarter cup, so you can feel the difference between them as well. And then money, for people who don't understand money and have more significant processing issues, we do very concrete things like connecting the dots between you do this one thing, you get a quarter, you do this next thing, you get a quarter, you get to the end, you've got four quarters, we walk right next door to Starbucks and buy a hot chocolate. That's how long ago we started this. Hot chocolate was actually less than a dollar at Starbucks. So this is actually Trep. He's the one we started it with. He's the guy who would get to the back. He'd be able to get to Julie if all of you tried to stop him from here. I've never met anybody quite as uh, efficient, brilliantly, you know, the escapist in the best way. So we start using the camera and printer first so he can order his own drinks at the restaurant. That's the, mo we have to start with something that's motivating because I don't want you to feel managed. I want you to see I'm getting something. I want you to be able to get it yourself. We do that first. Now we have what we call a shift from compliance to alliance. He starts looking at me differently than other people in his house because I'm letting him, I'm, ha I'm teaching him how to use this camera and printer and he's ordering his own stuff at the restaurant. So we go to the library, he takes, well, we, I've already put some pictures up so he has some modeling. You take the materials down, you get a quarter. You clean one computer screen, a quarter. The second computer screen, a quarter. You put the materials back, a quarter. That's the first day of work. We walk right next door and get hot chocolate. This guy worked for 16 years. From being staffed three people to one to 16 years of successful work. Because early on, like in the first couple of weeks, he came in one day where he was really doing poorly. He was triggered. You could tell he wasn't having a good day. And he says, bye, which is like, okay, everybody run for the hills because he's done. And I hold up the jig and say, we can be done. You don't have the money for the hot chocolate. And he sat down furious, stomping his foot, finishing his job. That's compliance to alliance. You're not working for me. You're making your own choice about staying here. 
he also makes choices about not going to work someday, right? But he understands what that means. We move from those small jigs to more money, to budgeting sheets, uh, uh, more sophisticated ways to get that information. Video resumes, we don't, uh, we don't support anybody to interview without one anymore unless they really don't want one and we have yet to meet a person who doesn't want their own video resume. And this is because when I go into interview, let's pick on somebody else in the back with the sunglasses and that beautiful shirt and you're like, yes. What's your name? Mari. Mari, Mari goes to interview with Omar. With Omar, Mari's looking for the position, Omar's supporting her. Who's gonna tell me about Mari in the interview? Mari will tell me some things, but you're gonna make sure that it's in professional language, right? So we've got somebody here kind of like steering that ship. What employers tell us and what applicants tell us again and again is, Mari wants to talk to me directly. And if you can support Mari to put together a video resume ahead of time, I'm gonna actually see and talk to Mari about it. This guy right here has just realized that the, the employer interviewing him actually just realized they went to the same high school and started connecting about it. They started to ignore me. We're in good shape. All right, we invented an app specifically to do this. You can go online and learn about it. I won't give you a live demo today because we definitely don't have time. Um, or actually, maybe we'll, we'll see. We, I've got film to show you but it allows you to capture and track and report to your own boss. It's actually getting updated right now, so give it a minute, because we're gonna have a version of it that's under $10 for home, that's just personal use. Here's how I make spaghetti, here's my physical therapy routine, all that kind of stuff. But it allows you to capture in film, photo, text, sound, and now you can import in the new version. Um, and it captures information. So here's what an example of something running. Eric's job on that last screen there, Eric over there said, uh, when the first, we went to the first APSI conference after we had built the app in, uh, in Long Island, California, if anybody joined, went there. Uh, and he, so he was the first presenter about it. And he said, somebody said, how do you like using the app? He said, I like using the app because the job coach can go away. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so I just had to show you him. So it collects data. We, we gather information on, based on the order of the visual brain. Now here's the thing that we have to work with coaches on. All of the communication structures are Mari wants spaghetti. And we start with a picture of Mari and then a made up picture of want and then a picture of spaghetti. Her brain doesn't need anything but the picture of spaghetti. That's where it has to start. I have to know where I'm going first, and then I can, then I understand what to gather. And this is, again, one of those marginalization issues. English is like a movie. It starts at the beginning and it goes to the end. What's your name? Stacy. So we see, here's a movie. Stacy is walking down the little pathway. It's dark, there's the woods. We hear the owl and see the moon. Don't go, Stacy. We but we don't know what happens to her or why or what the point is until the end of the film. The visual brain is a newspaper. Stacy abducted by aliens to teach lessons of world peace to humanity. <laughs> now my brain already knows where we're, good job Stacy. How's it going? Slow? <laughs> we're a little slow. <laughs> So now my brain knows what I'm gathering. So when I'm moving forward, I can use the steps in task analysis that I need and skip the ones that I don't or get right to the end game. You know where you're headed. So you'll see tray one looks like it looks when it's done. And then all the steps underneath, what? Oh, I don't know. Okay. So tray, so tray. So what's ever, the, the main, uh, here's what tray one looks like, is at the top. And then underneath it, there's a slide that has every little thing that goes in it. He can record, the first versions of it had recording and more detailed information. And this is compliance to alliance. From day one, the employer is telling Eric what he wants out of him in his job. And I am supporting him to build the structure to reference what the boss said. So when somebody is off course, instead of cheerleading them back, I'm saying, I don't know, what did David say about that? Also, this is gonna auto-generate charts, weekly, daily, or monthly charts that Eric sends to his employer. 
Now the boss, and we educate employers about it too, give us a little thumbs up about, yeah, hey Eric, that's looking good. Or if we see something going off course, we go to the employer and say, look, this is showing us this. You, you're his employer. If you call a meeting, you can assign me to support this with him. And now the employer is assigning me as an accommodation instead of me being the surrogate employer. So it writes those relationships. All right, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna move beyond that because you can learn more about it because we're gonna run out of time. But here's something that definitely um, want to cover with you guys. We did a poll of more than a thousand people in our field, individuals serve, teachers, parents, and more than 90%, you guys, more than 90% of us identify the biggest barrier to employment as the employer's ignorance or discriminatory practice. And there's a lot of heads nodding in this room, right? Now look at the second one, lack of motivation to work. The, kid would, the person would rather stay home. My child would rather be at home, doesn't really need this, we're gonna take care of him. Family beliefs, transportation. But we asked employers the same thing, and here's what they told us. No capacity, which means no money or no time. Their answers were directly related to, I want to do it, but we're in a, you know, we're in a budget crisis right now. We're doing something right now but we want to do it. And what that means is we, and here's the marginalization, stay fascinated, you ready? After I say this, I want you to all throw your hands up in the air and yell fascinating, you ready? Okay, because we taught them the capacity model. We are separate but not equal, which means we are not helping them meet their bottom line. Ready? Fascinating, uh-oh. That means when times are flush, no big deal, but otherwise it feels like a draw on them. So we're gonna talk about ways to shift that, and this is the conversation to bring to your governor. This is the data you wanna to bring to your governor. So in looking at the system, I'm gonna skip all those slides, you can read them later, sorry about it, but we had a, a, we had a company that we worked with, uh, we didn't know about Project Search, it was a hospital simply because I'd worked with a fully blind, fully deaf woman, had a great story, moved out into the rural Washington, couldn't get the hospital to call us back, went to them and said, hey, what's going on? And I met the right person that day at, at the desk. And we wrote, she was like, we gotta figure this out. We wrote this program together and it's been in existence since 2005. So we have had a lab to develop business-minded tools and collect data about the impact. Here's the most important one. And I have, we're, I'm an Apple user, I can give you the old one that we did in Excel, but if you want this, certainly email me, I'm happy to send it to you. In the first uh, hiring in that project, we did what we all do. Here's two people on my caseload. Let's look at anywhere in the hospital who is willing to let us in. Now that's the capacity model that we've taught them. And, what, and after we got them hired and after they did such a great job, we took film because film is the way you can tell stories in a really powerful way. We took film of everybody's thoughts of that pilot. And in that film, Reed's direct supervisor says, hey, I have an hour and 15 minutes more that I can see patients every day. Oh, fascinating. Why didn't I think of this sooner? Reed's there doing things that this guy used to have to do himself, and this guy is cross-trained and makes some moolah. So we just put math to it and said, hey, these are deferred funds. And it makes great sense, believe me, the math on this, even if somebody is working at 50% of their coworker is still gonna be advantageous for the company. Because who's filling the printer? Who's doing the, who's stocking those trays that Eric's, and this is actually the math for his job. 40 hours a week, he, we pitched 1650 an hour when minimum wage was still 725 and got it because look at what they're already paying to do that very job. They're paying the warehouse clerk and the supervisor who have other things, higher level, driving the, work, driving the forklifts, managing the outer relationships. So on the right-hand side, this tool tells the, the, job co the job developer exactly how to read it to the employer, but we leave this with the employer because most of the time when you're job developing, you're not actually talking to the person who can hire. Right? You're talking to somebody, you wanna leave the language to pass to the CEO, so you wanna have it ready. So we have a little uh, um, sheet we use. I'm gonna actually, 
yeah, I'm going to stop you here on this. I'm still going to I'm still going to give you all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's just not all going to come out today. So we put together this little four slide piece that we use in our in, in engaging employers. This, these are the national statistics. Why do this? Because unemployment for people with disabilities is abysmal and it's a virtually untapped pool of talent. But here are the statistics that are really powerful. And most of these are in direct contradiction to the myths and belief systems that we have today. Did you know that people with disabilities have 48% greater tenure in a job? Do you know how much retraining costs? It's obnoxious. Employers hate having to retrain. So hiring people with disabilities is going to save them money and sanity. 34% 30, 30, fewer safety incidents. How many times have you been with an employer and they're worried about the safety of someone on the job site? So here's the example we use. Reed Zimmer was taught what to do when the fire alarm went off. Now you might say, do I have time to go get my wallet? Wait, my favorite picture's on the wall. I'm going to grab those things. But Reed is going to get outside and follow the rules because he's a concrete guy. So 34% fewer safety incidents. 90% perform better than or equal to their peers. 40% less absenteeism. Do you know how much it costs when people are not coming to work? These statistics were gathered by James um, Emmett, I had to look at his name because I'm old and I have a lot of dead brain cells. Even though we got to work together to put some of these tools together, James is a corporate uh, consultant who helped Walgreens originally set up their model and works with Coca-Cola and Sears and all the big. So he's got 30 years of data on this. So these are actual statistics. <clears throat> the other thing we do is we go to their website and we look at their mission. We find out what it is. On the left-hand side, you see kind of the basic four tenants that we found on this one thing. We look on the right-hand side or what we write to them to say, here's how we can help you meet your mission. Oh, you want to build your community? You could, we could help you build a workforce that reflects the community that you're in. So we tell stories, I've been using Reed all the time because you know, he's working in rehab, he was working in rehab, and parents are bringing their children with disabilities into the rehab department, and there's Reed representing. So they're getting to dream for their children or redream for their children. And then there's that last cost, cost analysis piece. OK, seven minutes to show film. All right, which one should we do? Mm -hmm. All right. So just want to give you a couple of samples, and I'll probably speed through some of them as well. I'm just going to enlarge it so I have more control. All right. Oops. We have to turn my sound on. Oh, wait. Uh, this isn't going to work because we have um, miked. OK, so I'm going to put film on a link where you can look at it, because uh, the sound and uh, the captioning were the issue with the technology today. So let's use these last couple of minutes just to say. I'm going to, I am going to walk you through just a little bit, because I want you to um, understand the power of self-advocacy. This is a young man who's blind, who didn't, uh, didn't get ser gut services in his community school. And when I met his um, uh, agency supporting him, they said he can't get a job because he cries all the time. He's terrified of everything. And we taught the most basic blind strategies, you know, how to get his attention, how to, and he goes on film saying, here's my self-advocacy film. Introduce yourself. Loud noises scare me. I carry these headphones because. And guess what happened? Job, two months later. That self-advocacy, that ability to educate other people about what you need and, mm -hmm. all right, so we're going to move that and video resumes. I'm going to stop until I get to the very end. I do want to show you this. So this is Stephen, and I'm just going to talk you through it. This is Stephen who started his own uh, company putting the candy machines in Les Schwab tires and other places that had people waiting in the waiting room. Uh, and in his... He was having some medical issues uh, that made it harder for him to go to a regular job, so this was perfect. So he made a marketing film. He's got use of one hand. He's got a big dent in his head, and he makes sounds like, oh, oh. And the employer meets him and goes, I can't even imagine what this guy. So of course, the job coach is working so hard to try to describe all of. So here we have a film where the employer is saying, hey, we love having Stephen come in here. He does this. He does that. He's always conscient. Plus. 
we put in here everything that would worry the employer. I work quietly, I'm respectful, uh, I'm, really atten I'm really attentive to um, uh, food practices, et cetera, et cetera. And then at the end he shows like my favorite part is, you know, the money <laughs> of getting to work. And Stephen, I'll let this play in the background, but Stephen um, actually went to the Chamber of Commerce and they, uh, his support person went there and got money, to seed money for him to buy his own machines to start this. And he went to talk to them at the same day that I was presenting about these tools, these business-minded tools. Stephen rolls in in the back and sees me and goes, ah, ah, yeah, ah, ah, yeah. And so I voice interpret for him. Oh, she's the one who helped make the film. Show it now, show it now. So we showed this film and he got more customers in the meat right. There's that person-driven piece. When I own it, when I was part of making it, I understand how to use it, I'm motivated to use it. You're helping support me get to the thing. It doesn't mean that I've worked myself out of a job. My job is to build the accommodation for the employer, cost analysis, return on investment, right, charting around production, and the person who's in the job. At the hospital where I showed you our project started, they were bought out four times in the last five years. Oy. The last time they replaced their entire HR department. And I met the new HR director and said, nice to meet you. And she said, yeah, we don't have time. We're in serious crunch. You're going to have to close up your office. I'm, I'm really sorry. I was like, I got, you know, nice to meet you. And I asked her for 15 minutes. I just need 15 minutes. I understand you're used to Jerry's kids. That's not what we're doing. What we're doing is something really business-minded that's structured to you know, work well for you. She begrudgingly gave me 15 minutes. I brought a cost analysis for every position and a production chart from the app that we built for every position. She studied them and asked, it to, asked us to do it for them in two other hospitals. I have to be a business partner. I have to tell the business story. If I'm gonna meet with the governor, and this is why the governor is gonna meet with me, because of the money that is going down the drain for people not actually working. What is it costing not to work? Do you remember Carolyn Downs, the first kind of infusion of big transition dollars came when a woman said, you know what it's costing when a kid graduates from high school and they sit on the couch and don't go to work? At least $20,000 per, per kid in the first year. And boom, we had transition as a focus in the government, right? So if I want to talk to the government, if I want to structure the change, Bring the employer who's asking for it. We wrote a standard operating procedure based on what we're doing for them. We have official fading plans. We have concrete interviews. We know how to help them um, put their compliance on visual training tools, all of that kind of stuff. Because that employer is the one that needs to talk to the government. That employer's complaint about, hey, I can't even find people to, we're ready and you're not. Help us figure this out. Because once the employer is at the table saying, this is what we want, everybody else comes to the party. When we first started teaching video resumes, people would have phenomenal experiences. But then, it's not how we do business, so the iPad would sit on the side, it wouldn't happen again. So we started looking at implementation tools and structural ways to make, you know, make that happen. And when we sit, do you work for the, for the hospitality? No, you're right there with the beautiful flower in your hair, do you? Are you an employer? No, behind you. Yeah, do you work for, are you an, a provider? Um, with work now. I'm sorry to call you out like that in the middle of that. Isn't she, round of applause, yes, thank you. You look exact, almost exactly like the employer that I talk, anyway, um, let me, squirrel. <laughs> totally distracted. Oh no, and I have a brain injury, good luck coming back. What was I talking about? Uh, oh, I know, video resumes until we started working with employers around affirmative action hiring initiatives and using all the math to break the myth and the employer would post the job on their job site on their website we have letters from the OFCCP and the uh, EEOC to describe why they're allowed to do that so it manages right again we're accommodating the employer so they can do it but it says you must bring a video resume because we want to hire the person directly based on the skill set that we can see and guess what? Everybody made video resumes across the state, across the counties. So when the employer holds the bar of expectation in the right place and we partner with them to do that, that's actually the goal of all of our service systems, yeah? 
All right, I really appreciate, I know it's lunch now too. Thank you so much, you guys, for tolerating all of these changes today. Reach out if there's anything I mentioned that you don't get in the PowerPoint, just reach out, I'm happy to share tools.